That night, I had an uneasy sleep. Strange noises emanated from downstairs. It sounded like toenails were clicking back and forth on the floor. It must be Manicula making his midnight run, I thought, although I'd never known him to make a sound. And I smelled the funniest odor in the air, something familiar, though I couldn't place it. As the night progressed, it grew stronger and stronger until finally it tickled my nose and I sneezed myself awake. I jumped off of Toby's bed, still sniffling, and headed down the stairs for the living room to find Chester, to see if he could smell it too. The odor grew even stronger as I approached the living room. Standing in the doorway was Chester, a strange pendant hanging from his neck. Phew, Chester, I said. What are you wearing that awful thing for? It smells. Of course it smells, he replied. Here, I made one for you too. Put it on. Are you kidding? That thing smells like garlic. It is garlic, Chester stated matter-of-factly. Why are you wearing garlic? I asked, thinking that by this time Chester was capable of anything. As we walked into the living room, I tripped on another piece of garlic lying in the doorway. Careful, said Chester. Watch your step. I surveyed the room and saw that it was strewn with garlic. On the doorways, over the windows, around Benicula's cage, the poor little fellow had buried his nose as far as possible under his blanket. I was about to follow his example and return to Toby's bed to bury my nose under the blankets when Chester grabbed my tail with his teeth. You're not leaving this room until you put this on, he grumbled at me. At least I think that's what he said. I wasn't sure because he had my tail in his mouth. It's not polite to talk with your mouth full, Chester. Drop that tail. Meanwhile, my eyes were beginning to water. Listen, Chester snapped at me, fortunately letting go of my tail first. The book said to use garlic. What book, I asked, the joy of cooking? Chester continued, the mark of the vampire says garlic renders vampires immobile. What does that mean? It means they can't go anywhere if there's garlic around. Well, I've got news for you, Chester. I can't go anywhere either. The smell is killing me. But you've got to put it on. It says so in the book. If you don't put it on, I'll put it on for you. Oh, Chester, I said as my nose suddenly and involuntarily closed. I'm leaving this room right now. And I did. I was so sick to my stomach from the aroma that I decided to spend the early morning hours outdoors. As dawn approached, it seemed that it would be a peaceful day. The sky was clear, the birds were singing. I felt content after my difficult night just to be lying in the grass, feeling the ladybugs crawl up my ears. Suddenly the calm was broken. Strange piercing screams came from the area of the kitchen. Not again, I thought. What's turned white now? As it happened, it was Chester. There in the sink, lather with soap, was the feline detective yelling his head off. Mrs. Monroe was scrubbing him vigorously, and from the sound of her voice was in the middle of a long lecture. I don't know what's gotten into you, Chester. You've never played with garlic before. I thought you hated the smell of it, and here you've gotten it all over yourself. Stop wriggling, you'll get soap in your eyes. If you want to chew on something, I'll get you some catnip. But stay out of my herbs. Then she rinsed him off, rubbed him with a towel, and plunked him down in front of the stove to finish drying. Shut the door, he hissed at me. I'm freezing. That silly woman, doesn't she know cats don't get baths? What do you mean? I get baths all the time, I said, closing the door with my back foot. That's because you're too dumb to bathe yourself. Cats always bathe themselves. It's a rule. Everyone knows that. Well, at least it smells nice in here again, I sniffed as I settled down next to Chester by the stove. And it's all toasty warm here in the kitchen. Sure it smells nice again, he said, but now the house isn't safe anymore. What do you mean? I asked, getting closer. I mean, it worked last night. The garlic worked. No more vegetables turned white, did they? No, but that means Benicula did not get out of his cage last night. Maybe he was just tired, I said, or maybe he was full. Don't be ridiculous, he replied. It was the garlic. He could not leave his cage, but tonight he'll be free to roam again, and I've got to find a way to stop him that isn't smelly. Mr. and Mrs. Monroe were hurrying in and out of the room, stepping over us late for work. Mrs. Monroe yelled up to Toby. Don't forget to take the steak out of the freezer when you get home today, Toby, and leave it on the table to defrost, and this time remember to put a plate under it. Chester's ears perked up. Of course, he said, that's what I'll do, and he strolled past me with a knowing smile. Mrs. Monroe turned off the stove and left the room. It was too much for me to figure out, so I went to sleep on the nice warm kitchen floor. I was awakened by a bite on the ear. Chester was sitting by me, looking very impatient. Boy, nothing wakes you up, he said. I've been yelling and poking at you for ten minutes. I was dreaming, I answered defensively, about a place where there weren't any cats around to bother nice dogs and wake them up when they needed their rest. You can finish sleeping later, he said crisply. Right now, you have to help me. Do what, I asked. Get Benicula out of the cage. 
I sprang back. Get him out of the cage? I thought that's what you didn't want. I thought you said he was dangerous. What if he attacks me? Aren't you ashamed? Chester replied, afraid of a harmless little bunny. Harmless? I thought you said he was a threat to this house and everyone in it. Isn't that what you said? Isn't that what we've been talking about all this time? He is a threat, but only at night. During the day, he's just a very sleepy rabbit, and that's what we have to do it now while the sun is still up. Follow me, he said. There isn't much time. Toby stayed down here forever, and the others will be home soon. Boy, you must have been tired, Harold. You slept through lunch. I followed Chester into the living room. My heart was pounding as he unlocked the cage door with his paw. It looked as if he'd had years of experience opening locks. The door swung open. Benicula was sleeping peacefully. He did, however, look a little green around the gills, probably from the garlic. I was just wondering how a rabbit could have gills when Chester said, Okay, Harold, do your stuff while I get what I need from the kitchen. What do you want me to do? I can't read your mind. Get him out of the cage and onto the floor. I'll be right back, Chester said. What? 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 I verbalized. How am I supposed to do that? Use your head, he answered, and he was gone. Looking at the cage, I realized that was precisely what I would have to do. Until this moment, I had never had to face the possibility of actual physical contact with a real live rabbit. I looked upon my chore reluctantly. I seem to recall my grandfather telling me that one picked up a rabbit by its neck with one's teeth. This I attempted, though the very idea set my stomach churning. I squeezed my head through the tiny door and gently placed my teeth around the skin of the bunny's neck. To avoid any suggestion of violence, I've never been one for the sport of hunting, I preferred to think of myself as the creature's mother, carrying it off to safety. Unfortunately, I couldn't carry it anywhere, for once my head was in the cage, it wouldn't come out again. I could go neither forward nor backward. At that moment, Chester appeared at the door, carrying in his mouth what looked every bit like a nice, big, juicy, raw steak. My eyes popped, my teeth dropped panicula, my mouth opened, and I began to drool. After all, I had missed lunch. Chester, what are you doing with that steak? Haven't you gotten him out of there yet? I can't get either of us out of here, my head's stuck. Oh, Harold, sometimes I despair. Here, I'll get both of you out. I should have done everything myself. He came over, dropped the steak just a few feet away from me, and climbed up on my shoulders. You pull your head out while I push against the cage. Who gets the steak? I asked. Don't worry about the steak, Harold, just pull. I would have more motivation if I knew who is to get the steak. Chester ignored me. I pulled, he pushed, I felt something go pop, and we all fell in a jumble. Chester, the cage, Benicula, and me. When I looked around, Benicula was lying next to me, still sound asleep. There you are, I said. Well, we got him out. Now, let's eat. No dice, Chester said. Just read this book to me so I'll be sure I'm doing it right. And he handed me a book. That book, again. Start at the top of the page, Chester said as he picked up the steak. Why don't you read, and I'll hold the steak. Ugh, Chester replied. I took it to mean that I was to start reading. To destroy the vampire and end his reign of terror, it is necessary to pound a sharp steak. Chester interrupted. A sharp steak? He asked. What does that mean? I'll taste it and tell you if it's sharp, I offered. Oh, never mind, this will do. It's sirloin. Keep reading. To pound a sharp steak into the vampire's heart. This must be done during daylight hours when the vampire has no powers. Okay, he said, this is it. I'm sorry I had to go this far, but if they listened, this would not have been necessary. He dragged the steak across the floor and laid it across the inert bunny. Then, with his paws, he began to hit the steak. Are you sure this is what they mean, Chester? Am I anywhere near his heart? He asked. It's hard to tell, I said. All I can really see are his nose and his ears. You know, he's really sort of cute. Chester was getting that glint in his eyes again. He was pounding away at the steak harder and harder. Be careful, I cried. You'll hurt him. Chester increased his attack. I was really getting worried when the door opened and Mr. and Mrs. Monroe were suddenly with us in the room. Chester! Mrs. Monroe screamed. What are you doing with my dinner? Robert, get that steak away from Chester. And what's the matter with Benicula? Why is he on the floor? Mr. Monroe took the beautiful steak away. I wished it a fond farewell with tears in my eyes. As the kitchen door swung open, Chester whispered with cold determination, All right, the last resort! and dashed into the kitchen. Seconds later, he was back, carrying his water dish between his teeth. He ran toward Benicula and with a mad yell threw the dish of water at the rabbit. Unfortunately, he was so hysterical that his aim was not the best. With water dripping from my ears, I watched Mrs. Moreau pick Chester up by the scruff of his neck and toss him unceremoniously out the front door. 
Robert, we are going to have to do something about that cat. Look at this mess. Dinner's ruined, the poor bunny is out of his cage, and Harold is sopping wet. I tried to look as pathetic as I knew how. Aw, oh, oh, poor Harold, Mrs. Monroe cooed as she dropped me off. You've had a rough day, you and Benicula. I don't know what's the matter with your friend, but unless he learns how to behave, he'll just have to spend the night outside. Mr. Monroe, meanwhile, had restored Benicula to his cage, and the cage to the window sill. I couldn't believe it when I saw that Benicula was still asleep. And, Mr. Monroe said, the steak is ruined. Why don't we just let Harold have it? He deserves a treat anyway, don't you, old boy? I panted appropriately. After my delicious dinner, I turned my attention to the book still lying open on the floor. Another method of destroying the vampire is to immerse the body in water. The body will then shrivel and disappear, as the vampire emits one last scream of terror. Phew, I thought, so that's what he was trying to do. Thank goodness he missed. I had no regrets about missing a scene like that. Poor Benicula. I looked over toward the cage, and there on the other side of the window was a pathetic tabby face looking in. His little nose was pressed against the glass. I couldn't hear him, but from the movement of his lips I could see he was very unhappy. Poor Chester. As for me, Mrs. Monroe spent the evening petting me and the family chatted with me all night long. And of course I had had my yummy steak dinner, so it wasn't such a bad day after all. Except that now my steak was all gone. Poor Harold.